Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul I'll worship your holy name Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul I worship your holy name Lord, I worship your holy name Lord, I worship your holy name. Uh, We're finishing up our series today on King David and King Solomon as we've been looking at them over the summer. And we finished it up uh, with two readings from two of the books that uh, are attributed to Solomon himself. Last week we looked at the great love poem that Solomon wrote for his bride, the Song of Solomon, and today we look at the book of Proverbs. And so this will be, uh, my intent here today is to talk about what is the, the main theme of this book of Proverbs, but I also want to encourage you that, that this is a book to spend some considerable time in. I, I've said it a bazillion times here, um, exactly one bazillion, I've kept count. That, that one of the best things you can do for your soul is to read one chapter out of the book of Proverbs a night. If you do that, one, there are 31 chapters. If you do that once a night, you read through most of it once every single month. And if you can, if you can do that for six or eight months, then, then, uh, then you'll begin to become wise. But I want you to enjoy this book and to be as shaped as I have been by this book. Now, some of you will remember, maybe four years or more ago, I can't remember exactly when, we preached a series on Proverbs. Uh, This, I have gained some wisdom since then. I would not preach quite a, as long of a series on Proverbs as we preached then. And so some of this may sound a little bit redundant to you, and I want to encourage you with two very simple thoughts two gentle encouragements. One is this, and that is as people who come together to hear the Word of God, beware of the novel. I don't mean, you know, book, fictional books. What I mean is beware of always gathering up new thoughts and, and things that are interesting. You see, the reason why we gather together as the people of God is not just that we can have deep thoughts to take away with us through the week. The reasons really found as we gather together around the Lord's table, what do we say? The, the words of Jesus, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, take and eat this and remember, remember. Um, week by week, I forget the goodness of the Lord and I need to be reminded of it. And so it, it's not a bad thing that you should hear something over and over and over again in church. In fact, I would go so far as to say that until you're bored by something, you haven't learned it yet. So maybe it's a good sign if you get bored at the sermons. Maybe you're beginning to learn something. The other gentle encouragement I want to give you as well is that God has promised that when His, those who are called to preach His Word, open up His Word and proclaim faithfully what is in it, God has promised that He would speak to us there. And so, although we labor week by week to be very intentional to make sure that that you guys can listen and track and follow along with what we're saying, I want to gently encourage you that we are not the sole people responsible for your listening. You have a part to play in your listening as well. And, And I want you to consider that possibly from time to time during a boring sermon, if you listen very closely... God might say something to you that you might find to be precious for the rest of your life. That would be worth sitting through 30 minutes of boring for. So that's my short introduction. Let's pray before we open up God's Word, this wonderful book of Proverbs. Lord Jesus Christ, you open the ears of the deaf. deaf. And we come to you now acknowledging that without the work of your Holy Spirit, we will not hear you speak. 
So come, come, Lord Jesus, and speak to us. Blow in us the wind of your Holy Spirit. Encourage us, correct us, rebuke us, train us, that we might be faithful in following you and useful for your purposes, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, if you want to follow along with this today, you can turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. If you want to look in your pew Bible, it's on page 527. And Proverbs is uh, the book of Solomon that is a a collection of wise sayings, uh, all all sort of thrown together. In fact, uh, many of these wise sayings are thrown together without any apparent rhyme or reason. And he introduces the concept of wisdom here in the beginning of this book by telling us why wisdom is so precious. And so I want to begin this morning by saying first three things about what wisdom is. First, we find out in Proverbs chapter 1 that wisdom cannot be separated. Wisdom cannot be divorced from our knowledge of God. Right here in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 Solomon says these words, hear my son, or or, one seven rather, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now when Solomon says here beginning, he's not referring to a race. He's not saying you begin with the fear of the Lord and you move on after that to something else. He's saying that this word means more like the cornerstone of a building. Now remember that that in the ancient world they didn't have, you know, levels and lasers and, you know, these kinds of things that can plot and map out. And so the cornerstone, the the angle of the stone would would dictate how the building was built and, and a slight miscalculation in that angle could wind up with walls that were not properly aligned. If, if walls that are not properly aligned can cause a building that would collapse on your head and a building that collapses on your head can ruin your weekend. So the beginning of the work is very important. But Solomon is saying here the beginning of wisdom is that we fear the Lord. And so part of what that means is that though you may be very intelligent Though you may be very savvy and though you may be very educated, without a knowledge of God, of who He is, of His nature and His character and His purposes, you never can become truly wise. You never can become truly wise. I'll give you an example. If you're a business person, you may become very wise at earning a profit. And yet if you don't fear the Lord, you can begin to cut corners and and trim your morality a little bit. And and, and even though you've become very good at gaining money, you've abandoned wisdom. You've, You've departed from the ways of the Lord. And then you wind up in jail, which again, can ruin your weekend. You see, just being good at things isn't what wisdom is. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, and so that means it has a, it has a moral component to it. Part of the fear of the Lord is, is, is knowing right from wrong, but at the same time, at the same time, part of the fear, it, it, m- wisdom is not simply morality. It's not just knowing right from wrong. I'll put it another way, al- although there is a spiritual component to wisdom, simply being religious will not make you wise. We've all known religious people in our lives who were not, in fact, very wise, haven't we? Or, put it another way, we've all been in situations where we knew very clearly what was right and what was wrong for someone else. And yet, how to walk alongside of that person or not is is so complicated that we can't begin to wrap our minds around it. And so wisdom's, you can't divorce wisdom from morality, and yet at the same time, wisdom is greater than morality. It begins with the fear of the Lord. Now, we do need to talk about what what we mean by that when we say the fear of the Lord. Some of you grew up, when I grew up, we had a saying in our house that, that you were going to get the fear of God put into you. If you are of a younger generation and you have never had an adult tell you that they were going to put the fear of God into you, I want to just let you know that it was not a positive experience. 
if you grew up with that, you might, you might not quite understand what's meant here by the fear of the Lord. <laughs> it, it, it's not putting into you a fear of judgment. On the other hand, some people have looked at this and they, they don't like the idea of fearing God. And so they say, uh, all of a sudden they become overnight Hebrew scholars and they say, well, fear doesn't mean fear. Fear means awe. It means wonder. Um, let me just encourage you that, that, that when in the ancient world, when, when the Old Testament was being translated into Greek, these were ancient Jewish scholars, so they would know Hebrew better than you. I know you know it well, but they would know Hebrew better than you. And, and when they translated this word for fear into the Greek, they used the Greek word phobos, from which we get phobia, which means fear. So it's not just simply awe and wonder, but if you do a study, if you look carefully, if you look closely at how that's used throughout the scriptures, you begin to understand that the, the fear of the Lord it has this covenantal relational bent to it. A few weeks ago, we talked about how covenants are a category we don't really use today. The only covenant we really have anymore is the covenant of marriage. But when we share the Lord's Supper together, remember we, we take the, the, the wine and, and, and we recite the words of Jesus where Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant. The covenant is, is, the, is not just a legal contract. It's the binding together of two people like in marriage. And so when we talk about the fear of the Lord in the ancient world, when you were bound together in a covenant with someone who was greater than you, you that, that covenant treaty would tell you to fear your master, fear your Lord, fear the sovereign over you. And what that meant was that the relationship you have with him is the most important relationship you have in your life. And so that relationship takes priority over everything else. So to fear your master, to fear your sovereign in that sense meant that you feared stepping outside the boundaries of that covenant relationship. You feared being removed from his protection. You feared to dishonor him. You feared to displease him, not because you were afraid of judgment, but because you loved him and he loved you because you were bound to him and he was bound to you. Likewise, the fear of the Lord means that the relationship we have with God trumps every other relationship in our lives. And it means that as we walk through the complexity of our lives, this one thought governs us. That we don't want to step outside of the boundaries of His love for us. We don't want to be removed from His care and His protection and His favor and His pleasure. Not because we need to earn it, but because he's promised it to us. Seek the Lord with all your heart. And all these things will be added to you, Jesus says. Why does he say that? He's saying that when we fear the Lord, when that relationship takes priority over our desire for being secure or provided for or healthy or well-known, Everything else becomes governed and falls into place in the right way. And so though we can become very intelligent and even savvy in many different ways, if we do not fear the Lord, we become, as our bishop has said many times, like that man who spent his life uh, climbing that company ladder only to find out at the end that it was leaning against the wrong wall. The fear of the Lord is the foundation. It is the starting point. It is the beginning of wisdom. Which brings me to my second point, which is a very simple point, and that is this, that wisdom has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence or education or sophistication or savviness. The, the saying goes that intelligent people may know that tomatoes are actually fruits, but wise people know not to put them in fruit salad. That, that, and and here's some, here, here an encouragement and a rebuke. You do not need to be intelligent in order to fear the Lord. You do not need to be intelligent in order to become wise. Edu 
Education will not make you wise. Being savvy at navigating relationships or business or politics will not make you wise. And yet, and yet at the same time, we will not be wise in any other way than using whatever measure of intelligence or education or savviness God has given us to its fullest extent. Tim Keller relates this by telling the story of Miss Marple, who is the Agatha Christie character. Miss Marple is just a, a simple lady who's lived in one English village her entire life, and yet when she's confronted with these mist- murder mysteries and, and you know, the, the, this, the jewel heist mysteries, she sees to the core of it because she's become wise. In her little English town, she's looked into the core of human nature. And though she's not educated or worldly, She understands people, and so she becomes wise. And so likewise, wisdom has nothing to do with intelligence or education or savviness, which is why in today's reading, Lady Wisdom cries out and she says, Come to me, you simple ones and you scoffers. And then thirdly, wisdom... So we find, firstly, that wisdom cannot be divorced from our knowledge of God. Secondly, wisdom has nothing to do with intelligence or education or savviness. And then thirdly, we find that wisdom has a lot to do with being the right sort of person. It's not, oftentimes we ask people to pray so that we can make the right decision. And, and, and we, we think of that, I think, subconsciously that God will just make one thing very clear to us. But it has much more to do with what sort of person you are. Maybe I'll get into a little bit of trouble with this illustration, and maybe it's a little bit unwise for me to say it, but I always think this whenever I'm pulling into a parking spot at a grocery store and somebody's left their grocery cart there in the parking lot. I think, what sort of a person is it that won't even walk their cart to put it away? What, the easier decision there is to leave, but, but, but what kind of a person are you The Proverbs wants you to know? And as you read through this book, you'll find that Proverbs largely divides us up into two categories, the wise and the foolish. And the wise have have been shaped and formed and fashioned in a certain way. They fear the Lord. And so if you think about it this way, if you have a difficult business decision to make, if your chief concern is, is, is yourself, then you'll be clouded as you approach that judgment. I've known people who were very wise in navigating human relationships, and yet they were very manipulative. And in all of those navigations, they were always angling for their own personal gain. And though they're very wise in the sense of being able to navigate these things, they're foolish because... They don't love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind and love their neighbors as themselves. And so they look at situations and their vision is clouded because they're not the right sort of people. And so as we come to Proverbs, we're posed with a a question that is both very simple and at the same time very dangerous. And the question is this, are you wise? Now, don't answer it too quickly. I told you, it's dangerous. You're just like my kids. You want to just go go touch it. I just said, don't touch it. It's a dangerous question to ask that, are you wise? You see, as we come to this, to our reading today, that we read today, Solomon here has personified wisdom. And and wisdom here is crying out in the streets and in the city squares and in the midst of the busyness of life. And and she's crying out, how long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. And then Lady Wisdom goes on to say, because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. Now what's going on there? On the one hand, Lady Wisdom has said, come and I'll make you wise. Seek me and I'll give myself to you. And on the other side, on the other hand, she's saying, because you didn't listen, when, when this goes south, I will laugh, I'll mock, I'll scorn you. Is wisdom vengeful? Is, you know, is wisdom waiting for the great I told you so moment? 
Is that what's going on here? No. In order to understand this, we need to understand we've looked at what wisdom is, but we need to also now look at what folly is. And we find out here, as we read through Proverbs, we see that folly is, in its very nature, progressive. And I'm, I'm not making any kind of a political statement there. So don't, don't Twitter, tweet that or assume. That, what I mean is that folly grows. In other words, Lewis puts it like this. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He says, he says, we're all eggs and we must either go bad or hatch. Folly is the process of an egg going bad. Here in, this, in verse 22, Lady Wisdom uses three words to describe the foolish. She calls them simple ones. She calls them fools and she calls them scoffers. And as you unpack this book, you see that there's a progression that happens from being what are called here simple ones to becoming a scoffer. That word there for simple ones is an interesting word and it is really hard to translate. In one sense, it gives the connotation of youthfulness. These are people who haven't experienced much life yet. And so they're not wise, not because they've made a habit of making bad decisions, but they're not wise yet because they haven't made many decisions at all. I want to encourage our young people here today, your parents may not remember what it's like being 15 years old, but they have been 15. You've never been 50. And so there's an element of folly. Now, some teenagers have bruised ribs now from their parents now. Right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to throw you under the bus like that, but it's true. And, and, and folly here is, is, is a certain naivety, a certain, it's, it's just approaching life without having much. But if we begin to close ourselves off, if we, if we fail to learn from the experiences of life, if we fail to listen to what God says about the nature of the universe and who we are, then we begin to push ourselves down a certain pathway that will make us become more and more foolish. We could begin to come, become like that character in C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles, Susan Pevensey. If you haven't read these books, I really honestly cannot think of many good reasons why you shouldn't have read them yet. You may be illiterate, maybe you're dead or blind, I don't know. But if those aren't true for you, I would just pick them up and read them. They're children's books, they're easy to read, and they're rich and deep. But Susan is one of these children who has gone to this magical land of Narnia. And at the end of the series of books, the children are there and they've entered into everlasting joy and Susan is not. And when asked why, one of the cousins says she became too concerned with lipstick and pantyhose and invitations. And the point isn't that she hit puberty, but the point is this, that she, she, she lost her sense of wonder. So that when the other children would talk about the wonderful things that experienced in Narnia, she would say, oh, those were great stories we used to tell. You see, she had become too sophisticated for this land anymore. Likewise, many of us have become too sophisticated to actually understand the truth. In fact, I fear that some of us are so concerned with being sophisticated that we will never know the truth because in order to hold on to the truth, sometimes you must look very foolish. And so if we won't heed the instruction of the Lord, if we won't heed wisdom's calling, we will close our hearts off to the only one who is always wise. And folly will begin entering into our hearts and we will become finally what Solomon describes as the scoffers. And Proverbs 26 verse 12 describes the scoffer in this way. It says, there is a man who is wise in his own eyes, but there is more hope for a fool than for him. There's more hope for a fool than for him. If you're always wondering why nobody listens to you, perhaps it's because you've grown wise in your own eyes and you've stopped listening to other people. And there's a very serious rebuke for